Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Gathering Place right here in beautiful Simi Valley, California, where we still seem to be in somewhat of a winter. Um, I guess, I mean, we really don't have winters out here much, but you're kind of in one. It's been cold longer than normal. It's like it's the end of February almost, and it's still cold. What's going on here? Anyways, I like the rain because God told us he was going to give us rain, so... I like that happening. Uh, tonight, the title is kind of a, it's a little catchy because there are things that Jesus did that I, I've looked at them, I've thought about them, and I'm hoping to kind of stir you up tonight and make you think. And um, the title is God's Word Leads You Into Storms, or Is Jesus Training You? I should say, Does God's Word Lead You Into Storms, or Is Jesus Training You? And by the time we're finished, you're going to be saying, I want my storm. (laughs) So um, a couple of of interesting testimonies. I was, um, and these all happened within, you know, the last week or so. I was, um, as I told you, I was praying for Randy the other day. And the scripture that just came before me was, I have been young, now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. Well, we went in the back and we were talking about it. And he goes, he goes, that is my scripture. He goes, that's the scripture I stand on above all other scriptures. And so I, I, I sense by, I just sense that, that he was in some, somewhat of a financial battle. Uh, so I was just praying. And I'd just been kind of praying in the spirit for, I don't know, it seemed like a couple of hours. But that scripture just came up and we shared it to the whole group. But it was for him. And I love that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will always give you evidence or he'll always give you confirmation of things that you're fighting for, you're believing for. Now this one is really, it's kind of interesting. It had to do with Jennifer, the the girl that cuts my hair. And um, I, when I looked at her, I saw something like in her stomach area, but I didn't know if it was an intercession because she's a prayer warrior or if it was something else, but I knew there was an infirmity there. So I don't know if she was praying for an infirmity or she had one, but she had one. And this is what she told me afterwards as she was cutting my hair, which by the way, I was really glad she was healed when she was cutting my hair. That way there's no slip ups. <laughs> so, so she said for the past several weeks, she goes, I have been in so much pain. She goes, I've been standing on the word and trusting God. And she said, I just knew when I came, she goes, I knew when I was coming when I came in today, whether you called me out or no matter what happened, she goes, I knew I was going to be healed when I got there today. Well, this is, uh, I'm going to throw this out to you as a thought because I believe in this. When somebody's trusting God for something, a lot of times you'll get words of knowledge for that person or words of knowledge will come out because they're believing God, but they just need that extra little, that just that extra little bit to get over uh, so she was believing God, and her belief created the word of knowledge, which in turn released gifts of healing or gifts of healing, and she was, she was healed. So I just thought that that was an interesting healing, and having talked to her afterwards, because she said, she goes, I've just really been battling this for a couple of weeks, and it was really, really weighing on my, you know, really affecting her body, and, and her, you know, it starts to affect your mind after a while. Uh, so it was great that she was healed. Yeah. And then um, another one, and I, I don't remember if this, I think this was Saturday. I felt impressed to pray to break soul ties. Well, I got a text from somebody, and I'm so grateful that they sent me the text. Um, <clears throat> they said, I was, when I was driving to church, the Holy Spirit brought two soul ties to my remembrance that I had not thought about. And I realized I had never broken these soul ties and I thought I need to do this. And so when they got to church and I just said that, let's break the soul ties, that was the confirmation. Yes, God was speaking to me. Amen. You know, even, listen, even the greatest prophets like to get confirmations. Amen. I'm telling you, Kim Clement was the most accurate prophet I've ever seen. And he really liked it when he got confirmations. How many times I gave him a word and I was like, you know, this is a great prophet and I'm just... I'm not anywhere on that level, but uh, I feel the Lord is saying this to you. (laughs) That's a scary thing. 
But I remember one time he was going through a horrendous battle and one of my daughters, I think she was like seven years old time, she drew him a picture and wrote something on it and gave it to him. When he got the picture, he goes, yes, Lord, thank you. And he, it was the answer he was seeking. Literally, she wrote the answer. Now, that's just a kid drawing. They don't know they're prophesying. But a lot of times, the first things that we feel or sense are pure, and they are the prophetic. Amen. And then, um, I don't think we want to go into too much more, but I... I just thought it was interesting as I was driving down here today, I thought I was going to drive in a monsoon the whole way. It was raining so hard, but um, I thank God I didn't have to drive in the rain the whole way, but I was in the middle of the monsoon rain coming down. I was saying, I thank you, Father, the rain is coming. The rain, I just kept saying, the rain is coming. The rain is coming. Why? That's the prophetic word he put in my mouth. The rain is coming. So I say it all the time. The rain is coming. The rain. When will you stop saying it? When he tells me to stop saying it. When's well, that going to be? I don't know. When the drought's over, I don't know. He's doing something very, very special in California. There was another prophecy. It was a little while back that when Kwai Chang fell again, that there would be, um, that, that there, the ultimate fall would come after that. And that, of course, when its restoration is going to come. All right. So, Let's get into this, and we're going to read some scripture. Have you ever felt that you got into a battle that was too big for you? Uh, make sure, I'm not just I'm the only one that's ever had that happen. Have you ever been in a battle and you just looked at it and you go, that's, that's too big, or I don't know what I'm going to do, or this seems impossible. Like it just doesn't seem like it's possible to win this battle or to move in this direction. That happens. When the children of Israel were given the promise to go into the land of promise, I feel like, uh, I feel like the vice president there. <laughs> promise, land of promise. The promise was, no. I say promise four more times and we'll be in good stead. But what they, didn't, what they didn't know was that all they knew was you go into a land of milk and honey. What they didn't know was they were going to a land that was infested with unholy people and unholy giants. Nephilim. Wicked people. Strong people. Powerful people. You know, Shaquille O'Neal, he's like seven foot one. When he was playing basketball... He, was, now he wasn't just big, but he was agile. He was a great athlete. But he would just beat people up. I mean, he was so strong. Anybody guarded him, they just got beat up. Sidrunus, I think, Sabonis, he was seven foot five, and he was around 300 pounds. He was a big guy from Russia, and he was a good player. And he played for the Portland Trailblazers. And every time they played the Lakers... He made sure that he had a massage schedule for the next day because he got so beat up playing Shaq. And then when they would have seven game series, the other teams would just get worn out. He would just beat them up. And it wasn't like he was, you know, punching them in the face, but he just, he was just such a big, strong man. And, and unless you've really dealt with like somebody who's really big and strong, there are just some people that they're just, they're big and they have strength beyond comprehension. And I'm just talking in this realm. But can you imagine people 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 feet tall that, that are proportion, the strength of their arms and their legs, their speed, what they could do to you? I mean, David could not have beaten Goliath unless... He was learned how to operate in a supernatural way. Number one, you don't fight a bear and a lion as a, as a kid, as a teenager. You don't fight a bear and a lion unless there's something deep within you that's developed. And that's what God has wanted to do with us. He's wanted to develop this deep faith and this deep walk with him that when we come up against a lion or a bear, we're able, but then he can send us to Goliath. Now, you know, it may not be something as drastic as as what David had to do, that was a, that was a battle that changed the nation. 
But the children of Israel said, we're grasshoppers in, our, in, in uh, uh, their sight. We're like grasshoppers to these people. But God never, he never told them about the battle. He just told them about the land of milk and honey. So, so a lot of times we get prophecies or prophetic words. We're like, yay, yay, yay. And then we don't realize there's going to be some battles along the way. So sometimes God is going to walk you into some battles. Now, I want you to read with me, or you can look up on the, the, the board here. At Matthew 14, verse 22, it says, Straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. He said, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea. So who sent him? Who sent the disciples on the ship without him being on it? Jesus. Jesus. So they had, they literally had the commandment of the Lord to take that ship to the other side. He said, take the ship to the other side. So they had the commandment of the Lord. How's that now? Nope, not yet. I both love and hate technology. Okay. <clears throat> So the ship was in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now what if Jesus hadn't have come and walked on the water? They had the commandment to go to the other side. Would they have died with the commandment? Was it his will for them to die? No, of course. His will was for them to walk with them for three and a half years and then go on to all the world. So that was his desire. But he gave them a commandment, and when God gives you a commandment, you have the authority to fulfill that commandment. When God gives you a word, you have the authority to fulfill that word. But the enemy came, what does he do? He comes to steal the word that was sown. Well, this word was simple, go to the other side. So the, they were in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. The wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou uh, bid me come unto thee under the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. When he saw the waves, excuse me, saw the wind, boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. Now, I want to say something. The hardest people to have, to have uh, divine healing for are doctors and pastors. Why? Because pastors hear every unbelieving story from every congregant that hasn't been healed. And doctors are so steeped in their medicine that they can't think beyond medicine doing the healing. Now, Peter was a fisherman. So he might have been a rough character to try to, fig to, to get to walk on the water because he's a fisherman and he's moved by the wind. He's moved by the waves. And he was. So he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him and said unto him, Oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So he wasn't telling him. He wasn't saying, hey, that was pretty good, Peter. You almost did it. He said, you were moved by your circumstances. But the waves and the wind, and I'm a fisherman, and, and it was bad. Well, I know. And Jesus knew that. But Jesus wasn't merciful toward him in what he said. Now, he was merciful toward him in what he did. He saved him. We got it up? Oh, yeah. So he was merciful in what he did, but what he said, now, I don't, I don't think Jesus said things to be harsh. I think he said them out of love and, and a loving correction, but he was a correcting him. He said, oh, ye of little faith. And we know that of the six levels of faith, what is little faith? It's the faith that is moved by circumstances. Now, little faith can obtain things sometimes for a short while. Little faith walked on the water, but it couldn't maintain it. 
So sometimes we get, we have a victory and then, you know, we go, yay. And then we stop and then we start sinking. So this is what happened to Peter. So what was Jesus doing here? What was, what was his purpose? I mean, did he, did he send them out there to scare them to death? Did he send them out there so he could laugh at them and go, <laughs> ah, that's so, I thought it was so, so funny watching you guys scream. No. Can I tell you what I think happened? Well, he said, wherefore did you doubt? When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. I believe that Jesus was teaching them that they had dominion over the sea. And over the wind, over the waves, over the, over the circumstances, over the weather. I believe that's what he was teaching them. Because that's what he did. He exercised that, but he kind of chewed them out for not exercising it themselves. Now there was another time Jesus was asleep. He was on the boat and he was asleep. And they came into him. They said, hey, come on, wake up. Can't you see we're about to die? You need to come do something. Also, he calms the waves and the wind and the sea. And then he said, oh, ye of little faith. Is he, like he roughed them up again. Why? Because they had the commandment to go to the other side. That means they have the authority to do it. When you have the commandment to do something, anything that gets in your way, you have the authority to get it out of your way. Now listen to me. This is the season where a lot of people have been asleep. While the enemy has just literally taken, he's literally taken over the schools of America and brought in things that the Bible call abomination. Uh, what, have we, what have we done? We haven't done a lot. Sometimes you have to be put in a battle that's beyond you to see that you can fight better than you think you can so that God can send you into other battles. But if you don't think you can win the battle, or if you think, if I go into this battle, this might affect me in my personal life here, if you think that, he can't put you into that battle. So God will allow you to step into some battles in your personal life so that you can win them. He wants us to win all the battles. He wants us to win the battles in our personal life, and then he wants us to win the battles on a larger scale. So Jesus sent them out there. I, now, did he, know the, did he know the storm was coming? I don't know. It's possible that he did. Remember, he wasn't all-knowing when he was a man on earth. He didn't know there were no figs on the tree. But he did know things about the future. So did he know? I don't know. But isn't it interesting that when he was walking on the water, he didn't calm the sea. He waited till he got there to them and I think one of the other gospels said he would have passed by, but they cried out to him. What does that tell you? That tells you that he sent them there with the authority to calm the sea themselves, that he, he wasn't planning on doing it for him. He was walking by them. What are you, what are you saying, Bob? I'm saying that God wants to put me in a battle that looks like I can't win, that I have to win. I'm not saying you because I don't want to make you panic. So what do you want to do, Bob? I want to, I want to be put in a battle that doesn't look like I can win, so I can win. I want that battle. Okay, good for you, Bob. We'll be back you up. Like I said, he could, have, he could have stopped the waves and the wind the moment he started walking on the water. But he didn't. He didn't until literally he got in the boat with them. 
He didn't while Peter was walking on the water. He didn't, he didn't still the waters while Peter was walking on the water. It was still, the storm was still blowing. He didn't stop it until he had made his point, until he had trained them. Now, I, don't, I, I can't think of a place in the Bible where any of the disciples, other than you know, Paul was on a boat that was doomed, but he actually prophesied it. But I can't think of a place in the Bible where the disciples a- a- ever ended up still in a storm. So it wasn't, so this, this battle wasn't about learning how to walk on water and still storms. It was about authority to do the things that God's called you to do. Regardless of the circumstances. I don't have, I don't have any money. That could be a storm, right? A financial storm? All right. See, you're bored, so let's move on. Okay. So John 6, verse 14, uh, verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. What? Well, what are you saying here? I'm saying Jesus is being a little bit of a hoser here. He said it, he said it not because he didn't know what was going on. He said it to make a point. What shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So he knew what he was going to do, but yet he says this. Why does he say this? Because he's trying to teach them something. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down, now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in the number about 5,000. How many women and children do you think were out there? Probably at least minimum another 10. But it could have been easily 20. It could have been, it could have been double. Jesus took the loaves when he had given thanks and he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. You know what? That's a long day. (laughs) That's handed out a lot of food. And likewise of the fishes, as many as they they would. And when they were filled, he saith unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. And we, we dealt with that a few weeks ago that Jesus didn't believe in waste. He doesn't believe in wasting things. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the, 12, of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. And those men which had seen the miracle that Jesus did said, this is of a truth, a prophet that should come into the world. Well, if he was just trying to prove that he was that prophet that should come into the world, he wouldn't have proved Philip. If he just wanted to prove that he was this miraculous person, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have walked on the water just to prove that to them. He was trying to teach them something. This was an impossible, listen, it was an impossible situation. They didn't have enough money to buy food for everybody. They had a, a, boys, you know, a boy had five loaves and two fishes. They might have been really small loaves. I don't know. But they fed a multitude with that. Now, he knew he was going to do it, but he challenged Philip on it. Why? He wants to train him. God is, listen, he is challenging us in the body of Christ right now so that he can train us. He's going to push us and challenge us to do some things. You're going to be somewhere and somebody's going to be in distress about something. And you're going to say, wow, you seem distressed. You know, is it, could I pray for you? 
and you don't know what you're going. You don't know what you're going to do. You have no idea what you're going to do. You, you don't know. You don't know what they need. You're not a mind reader, a psychic. But you know what? You take a step out on the Holy Ghost and you start to pray for them and you trust in the Holy Ghost. And suddenly you'll pray something over them, some word or words that completely affects them and transforms them and, or changes their day. You might be in a personal situation that it looks like it's hopeless. When they were in the boat on the ocean or on the sea, or in the ocean they were on the sea, it looked hopeless. These were fishermen. They knew they were going to die. These guys, not all of them were fishermen, but enough of them were fishermen that they knew they were going to die. They had not been in a storm like that. They knew their ship couldn't take it. They knew they were going to die. Jesus allowed them to be put in that situation, I believe, so that he could train them how to overcome the most impossible odds. Because he knew that those 12 were going to lead a revolution that would change the world as we know it. Are you with me? I'm hoping that I'm not just bringing these stories from the Bible. I'm hoping that it's kind of like hitting you. And maybe there's something in your personal life right now you're going, oh, yeah, that kind of hits me. I, I, I realize, you know, I've been, I've been in this battle, and I realize, oh, yeah, this doesn't look hopeful to me. But I think I'm realizing now that God wants me to win this. And I don't even know how to win it, but, I'm, but I know that he wants me to, so... I'm going to really trust the Holy Spirit to help show me exactly what to do. It's interesting that right now in the financial world, nobody knows which direction the stock market's going to go. The experts don't know. Why? The world is unpredictable. You know when it talks about wars and rumors of wars? When you as a nation put $100 billion into a war effort for another country, you're in that war. A war that they didn't want. That they actually had negotiated a peace. So you have somebody bumbling around that seems to want to start a war calling the other people war criminals. Pretty hard to come back from that. You know, if you just have a dispute over something, maybe you can eventually negotiate it. But if you're calling them war criminals, that's hard to come back from. So the Bible says there's wars, there's rumors of wars. Jesus said, you're going to hear wars, rumors of wars. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So we're living, in, we're living in times where we need unusual and miraculous faith. Now, you may not think that much of this, but when we were in a drought and we, as a body, prophesied the rain is coming. Oh, no, that was you, Bob. No, 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 I just had the word. We, as a body, prophesied the rain is coming, the rain is coming, the rain is coming, the rain is coming. You know what? We changed the outlook of the weather and the drought in Southern California. Amen. Who? This is a little body right here. Well, Bob, maybe there were a hundred other bodies. That's true. There could have been a hundred other bodies that did exactly the same thing. I'm, I, there's no prideful thing here. What I'm saying is a small group or just somebody, somebody with a word of the Lord in their mouth can transform a state where there's 40 million people. What other words can he put in our mouth? What other battles can he give us? You may not know this, but when people come in here, especially if there's a word of knowledge for healing, when you're stretching your hands and you're stretching out your faith, your faith affects that person. 
All of us together combining creates a greater faith. And if we begin to declare things that God's telling us to declare, like the rain is coming, we are going to have a transformation. They may say, I don't care how long they say there's a drought. We've had rain every single week. I mean, like I said, I drove down in rain today. There's going to be rain tomorrow. There's going to be rain Saturday. Like, how about on Sunday? You know? No, I know. I mean, how about on Sunday so I don't have to drive on Saturday in the rain? I was driving one Saturday, and it rained. It was a monsoon the whole way. Two and a half hours, because everybody's moving really slow. And nobody's using the far left lanes, because there are all waters in there. You don't want to start hydroplaning. And Californians don't drive in range much, so they're not very good at it. So you have to be extra, extra careful. All right. So Mark 11, we know this, but let's just go through it rather quickly. If you were late by any chance and missed the first part, go back and re-listen to it, because I think that God is saying something to every one of us that are here tonight, and those who are listening. If you came on late on the air, go back and, and listen to the beginning. I believe there are things there, that foundations, that are going to help you. So in Mark 11, he says this in verse 12. On the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. It doesn't say on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, the Holy Spirit led him to go to a fig tree. What led Jesus to the fig tree? He was hungry. He had need. Anybody here have any needs? We all have needs. So his need for food led him to the fig tree. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything to run. Okay, here's another point. I mean, he's Jesus, right? People think that Jesus just walked around knowing everything. Why didn't he know there were no figs on the tree? <laughs> I mean, you think the Holy Spirit could have just let him know. There are no figs there. But if he would have let him know, we wouldn't have this great story. So God allowed Jesus, a, he allowed a hungry Jesus to walk a long way to get nothing. so that he could teach us something. Now God the Father knew what was gonna happen, but Jesus the Son did not know what's gonna happen. So he walked a long way and he got to a tree and what he got was disappointment. Remember when you were believing for the piano? And we got a piano and what was it? Disappointment! Because it wasn't the right piano. But we ended up with the right piano. Short order. Best piano. My favorite piano in all the world. Somebody could come in and, and ha say, I have a million dollar piano and I'll trade you. I wouldn't trade it. So he said, he couldn't find anything on that. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet. Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. So he essentially cursed the fig tree. Now why did he do it? Did the Holy Spirit, it doesn't, it doesn't say the Holy Spirit led him. I, I, I think he was maybe a little bit annoyed. Don't you? He was hungry. Don't you get, don't you, aren't you more easily annoyed when you're hungry? Aren't you a little more grumpy when you're hungry? You remember that commercial where it's a Snickers commercial, and it has somebody, you know, it has somebody, and they're all, and it's like this different person. They're cranky, they're, they're cranky and grumpy, and they need a bite of Snickers, and they transform into a different person. That's how a lot of people are when they're hungry. Well, Jesus was a man, tempted in all points like as we are. He was hungry. So I'm not sure that he was led by the Spirit to do this, but you know what he did have? He had the authority as a man on earth, and with that authority, he could speak to that tree whether the Holy Spirit led him to or not. And in the morning as they passed by, now he went into the temple and they cast out and all that kind of stuff happened in the temple. In the morning they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter called to remember and saith, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. 
But the better translation is have the faith of God. Like do what, do what God does. Act like God acts. For truly or verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. I know you know this story so well, but just humor me just a little bit by actually paying attention. So, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. But that's, that, there was nothing bigger on the earth that they were aware of than a mountain. And that wasn't even a really big mountain. Not compared to what we have over here. Whosoever shall say unto this. He's, what, what was Jesus saying? He was saying, you can terraform the land. That's something that God showed me in dreams and in times of prayer. He showed me places in the desert that were going to become gardens. We can terraform the land. We can bring mountains down low and create valleys where people could live. No, we can't do that, Bob. We can't do that. It's not real. It's not realistic. I know. But it is really what Jesus said. But remember, 200 years ago, that had no sense whatsoever of what it meant to be a son of God. In the 1950s, Christians were barely catching on to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Through Kenneth Hagin, they began to learn about the authority of the believer. Or Roberts, they learned that the healing was for today, that God was good. People didn't know that. Through the prophets movement, people learned they could hear the voice of God. We're still learning it today, but we are learning and we're learning our sonship. That means that there are things that we can do that, that, that years ago we would just think, oh, that's not possible. Listen, if you have a vision or a dream that's enormous or expansive, don't just tell it to anybody. Because there's some people who will listen to you and they'll go. <laughs> now maybe, you're, maybe your dream is just to transform your own family. But that's a big thing, right? Yes. So that's a powerful thing. That's a mountain that in your case might need to be moved. And you may be, I've been praying for that for years, Bob. Yeah, but maybe you're in a different time. Maybe God is transforming you. Maybe there are more angels on the earth. Maybe there are more things that are happening and your faith is greater Have the faith of God. For truly I say unto you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. I mean, listen, that's an actual thing because he stilled the waves and the storm. He commanded a tree and it, it literally, within a day, the roots it dried, dried up from the roots. So literally, a mountain can be moved. Now listen, I... I, this is nothing against anybody here. There's not a single one of you right now that actually believes that you could do that, that there's any way you could do that. You know, and I'm right. Because you haven't done it. And then there are some people that just, they're smoking stuff. Anyways, I'm just having a little bit of fun with you. Okay. None of us have moved a massive mountain anywhere. Now, it has been done before. There was a mountain moved, and I forget the story, but they, these people, they were going to be executed. This was like in the early 1900s. I want to say it was somewhere in Arabia. And they, they spoke, and the mountain moved three inches. Now, they were spared because of it. The thing is, this is possible. Now, the disciples, they never moved a mountain because there was, I guess there was no need to. But the point here is not about moving mountains. It's about moving mountains. It's about transforming things. You might say the school system is a mountain. 
Can it be transformed? If you speak to it, it can. If you speak to the spirits that are behind it. Now, God may not lead you to do that specifically. He has led me to pray about that for years. So I have been speaking to it. So everything I'm seeing happening, I'm just, I'm rejoicing. Because I've been praying, God, blow it all up. Blow it all up. Yeah. Now, I don't want it just to change. I want it blown up. Yeah. That's right. What do you want? I want a completely different system. He said, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have them. So that's amazing. Bob, how come we don't see more answers? Well, verse, Jesus was stupid enough to put verse 25 in there. Like there's just some things he did that were stupid. If he would have left verse 25 out, the, it would have been fine. And we'd all be working it. But he had to say, when you pray, forgive. If you have ought against any that your Father also in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So he's saying, um, yeah, you can do these things, but uh, if you want to block your miracles, just live in unforgiveness. Now, I've pastored enough churches over many years to know that a lot of people enjoy their unforgiveness. Gives them a feeling they feel something. No, some people, listen, some people... Because they don't feel anything, they want to feel something. If they're angry at somebody, it's like they feel something, like it's something they can feed off of. Even though it may be destructive. You don't know what they did to me. I realized they stole your movie ticket as a joke, and you couldn't get in and see the latest edition of Star Wars. You should thank them for that. They saved you from a fate worse than death. Anyways. As the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about this, because that's why I'm not teaching in Ephesians tonight. As the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about this, he had me look at some things, and he said, I want you to move these mountains. Now, obviously, not actual mountains. I like the mountains unless I could move them closer. I want you to move, he, there's, he said, I want you to move these mountains. Now I hate to say this, when I was raised up in ministry and stuff, we were taught the, the mountain was to have a big ministry. Now, when, when I had a big ministry, I'll tell you what, I was so busy that I spent all my time praying for all the people that weren't praying. And I was counseling so much, or meeting with people so much, <laughs> this is really bad. I was so worn out because I was working, you know, pretty much seven days a week. Teaching Bible school, two churches, meeting people multiple days a week. So I was in my office meeting with this one guy and he went into Nora and he said, Nora, could you reschedule this when Bob's awake? Because I fell asleep. <laughs> I told him later, well, you shouldn't have been so boring. <laughs> did you actually say that? I did, but in fun, you know, in fun. I just, I just was wearing myself out. Well, that's not, Jesus, I'm sure he was a little bit tired because he went a lot of hours. But I don't think we were supposed to wear ourselves out I think the body, all of us have mountains that God wants us to speak to, that he wants us to pray over, that he wants us to transform. Everybody here has one. And if you, if you said it out loud to some people, they would go, you're crazy, Rodney. <laughs> yeah. But then there'd be some people that say, you're not crazy, you're going to do it. So you don't, you don't cast your pearls before swine. I really believe this with all my heart. I really believe that God wants us to begin to bring down mountains or to transform things or to calm the sea. Jesus taught his men. He, he put them in perilous situations, seemingly. 
But in those perilous situations, there were great revelation that came to them. Also, sometimes you're going to be put in perilous situations. Now, listen, when I cut my finger off, I don't believe that Jesus had anything to do with that. I think that was all me. But in that perilous situation, I learned to trust God to not receive the opinion of the doctor, not that he wasn't qualified or knew more than me as a doctor, but I knew that it was, wasn't his finger, it was my finger. And what he was suggesting was unacceptable to me. And I believe that God could do it. And you know what? God did it. To the amazement of the doctor. I believe we can move mountains. But more than that, I believe that we're in a time when God is saying, I'm giving you mountains to move. Some of us are saying, there's, there's situations in our life are saying, this situation, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what to do about it. You do now. Don't panic. Pray. Take hold of it. Like grab hold of it. And pray. That's what I, honestly, that's what I do over, if there's a, if there's a certain situation, I don't just ignore it. I mean, I don't, I don't buy into the worry of it, but I'll take hold of it and I'll grab hold of it and I'll pray. Shameless persistence till it's here. Okay. So this is something completely different. This is our offering scripture tonight. And why is it Psalm 23? Because today is <clears throat> February 23rd. So I thought, 23, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, what do you know? It's a financial scripture. <laughs> The Lord is my shepherd. He didn't say, I shall not need. He said, I shall not want. What do you want? Well, if the Lord's your shepherd, you won't have want. That's what David was saying. If the Lord is your shepherd, you will not have want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That means that you will have peace. He leads me beside the still waters. This is from a man who fought a giant, who fought many times nations, who had his whole family and everybody stolen from him and his 400 men wanted to kill him and blame him. This is from a man who was hunted by Saul, who was the king of Israel, tried to kill him multiple times. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. This is a man that had Everything you can think of thrown at him. You know, somebody said this, and, and uh, some people don't like it when you speak about Donald Trump. But somebody said this about him, like when Barack Obama was president, he was president for eight years. When he came out, his hair was gray. And he looked beat up and haggard. When George Bush went in, he came out, he looked beat up and haggard. And, and um, that's, I mean, that's got to be the toughest job in the world because... Half the people in the country think you're an idiot and tell you. But they made comment, I think it was Joe Rogan, who is, you know, he's no uh, right-wing conservative. He made comment, he goes, he goes, Donald Trump looks energized. He looks better than he did when he went in. It's like the more they come at him, the better he gets. Say, well, I mean, he, no, he literally, he, he looked better, he looked better and they were on him every day. They were impeaching him from day one. They, they had false dossiers paid for by his political opponent. That's hard to fathom that it's happened in this days and age. Paid for by his political opponent, and they put him on trial over it. And his, his presidency was fought every single day. And he looked better at the end than he did going in. How can you do that in the midst of turmoil every single day? Like, like the turmoil of one of his days is enough for us for a year. 
Like you see the turmoil, one day turmoil for him, that's like, oh my God, that's a year's supply for me. And he was better when he came out, why? He was God's anointed, he was anointed to do it. He was anointed to be there. He was anointed as a warrior, he was anointed to take it. Every battle that came at him refreshed him. Every battle that came at him raised him up, made him stronger, made him better. That's what your battles are gonna do. Because you're anointed, you're anointed. God has anointed you and the battles that he brings your way. What do you mean he brings my way? He brought the children of Israel to a place of battle. You know, I, I, I've just realized I haven't, I, I don't think I've ever said this, but I, I haven't heard it in back since the 90s. Kim Clummy used to say it all the time, but I've just never thought about it. He goes, the one thing the church is afraid of is war. You know? <laughs> like he was, he was wanting us to go into war. He was singing songs like we're a kick devil butt generation. And you know, some parents were going, oh, Kim, I, some of those words are a little bit offensive. You know? <laughs> he was telling a church that was ready to be raptured that they had some battle to do. That they had fighting to do. He was giving people words way into their future. He gave a word to my son when he was eight. And I go, oh, Kim, if, uh, you know, before I, I knew all the rapture stuff was BS. I said, Kim, if, uh, what if, uh, you know, you gave that, that sounds like, that sounds like my son's going to be pretty old when that word's all fulfilled. And I go, he's, he's like eight years old. He's 37 now. So it seems like he's, you know, it seems like a lot of things uh, won't be fulfilled. Jesus is returning. And he gave me a very sweet answer. I won't tell you what it is because it was a lie. Anyways, it just placated me until I got the real answer. Anyways, we, we are supposed to be taking these territories. And so sometimes God is pushing us. He's pushing us into these battles. Because he's, he's like, hey, I want to give you this car. No, I, I don't feel worthy to drive it. No, but we'll see it as a battle. He's, he's, so he's pushing us into battles that he knows that we are capable of winning. He wants us to win. He needs us to win because it's going to build his kingdom. It's going to give you a testimony. He wants you to have it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So he's saying he restores my soul, leads me in the paths of righteousness. I'm by green pastures, all these things. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There's a shepherd speaking there. He's not saying that he didn't have issues. By the way, the, the valley of the shadow of death is a real place. And he walked there. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. By the way, the, your enemies aren't the other people in the church. Just so, just so you're aware. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely. I can remember this as a, as a kid in the Nazarene church. We would sing this song and I had... I had no idea what it actually meant. Yeah, that's it. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> I needed more help than that, Rodney. <laughs> so surely, he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That tells you a lot about the way God feels about you. That tells you a lot about what he has planned for your life. Your life. God has, his plan for your life is goodness and mercy. And when you think you failed him and you haven't done enough and you haven't done this and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and how bad you are, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Well, Bob, I have issues. Well, David had an issue. He was a bad father and a murderer and, you know, other things, but adulterer. Surely, goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. Even when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's the, that's the problem. When people are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, they, they can't see God. They, can't, they think they can't hear him. But he's giving you the mountain. What do you do? You keep pressing and you keep praying in until you pray through. We're seeing stuff happen in our nation. We're seeing what's happening. We're seeing the hand of the devil in Ohio through the rails. But at the same time, we're seeing the hand of God in Asbury, in Lee, in Sanford, where they don't have room for the people that are coming to feel the presence of God, to be touched by the presence of God. The enemy is in his last throes. He is in his death throes, screaming. You ever notice when demons come out, they come out screaming? They're screaming right now. The enemy is screaming because he's coming out. He's being dethroned from his position of dominion and authority. He's being dethroned by the body of Christ. Oh, the Lord's doing it, Bob. Yeah, he's doing it throughout the body of Christ. Because that's how he does stuff. He splits the Red Sea through Moses. He, ra he raises the dead by Jesus, by the hands of Paul, by the hands of Peter. He doesn't just all of a sudden the dead raised. Oh, I was laying there and God raised me up. No, somebody prayed. He's doing it through us, through the body of Christ. And we're seeing the transformation. The giants are coming down. And to me, the story of the water and walking on the water is a story of overcoming the giant. The, what's the giant? The waves and the wind, the sea. What's bigger than the sea? He said a mountain could move, but he calmed the sea. He, he transformed the sea. By, by the way, he also walked on it. He said, I will not sink on you. You will hold me up. And it did. All right. Amen. So with that, I want to go back to that very first verse. I want you to read that. Go ahead and read it out loud. That's your scripture. That is your scripture. The Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. You think you could say that every day, Belinda, for about two months? I'm going to say it with you. I'm going to say every day, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I'm going to say, the Lord is Belinda's shepherd, she shall not want. And you're going to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you're going to say, the Lord is Bob's shepherd, he shall not want. Amen. Which you're all welcome to say about me. <laughs> okay. So with that, we're going to receive the offering tonight. And if you're... Giving, make your checks out to the gathering place or those that give to Soaring Ministry. Same thing, you can scroll down and it'll tell you what you can give to as you text it in. And for anybody who gives cash, we have envelopes here. If things transform enough in our country you're not even going to have to think about doing that ever again. What do you mean, Bob? You're not going to need tax receipts. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you. For every storm you have brought into my life to train me up and to teach me how to walk in the realm of the miraculous. Thank you for giving me the DNA of Jesus that I can use that DNA to walk on this earth as a son of God with dominion and authority. And Jesus, thank you for being my high priest 
Tonight we bring our tithes and offerings. We present them unto you as a sweet savor. And we ask you to present them unto our Father as an offering in righteousness. Father, we humble ourselves by proving you in this way. And I thank you for America, that you're pouring out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive. Now we're gonna make a prophetic declaration tonight. Talk about giants, right? I feel a prophetic word. Remember when I heard the word, the rain is coming, the rain is coming? Okay. The oil spigots are opening. I hear that. I want you to say this, the oil is coming. The oil is coming. The oil is coming. The oil spigots are opening. And the oil is coming. The oil is coming to the United States of America, to Europe. The oil is coming. The oil is coming. The oil spigots are opening. I prophesy. The oil spigots are opening. I command the oil spigots to open and oil to come flowing out. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. I didn't know that was coming, Rodney, but I needed to preach this so I could say that. If I didn't preach this, I don't know if I could have said that. The oil is coming. The oil is coming, my friends. The oil is coming. The oil is coming. The oil is coming. <laughs> oh, God is good. Can you say God is good? Go ahead and receive the offering. Oh, my God. That is so good. I did not know God wanted to say that tonight. I didn't know that. I don't know if I had the faith for that. But that word did something in me. And when the Holy Spirit said, the spigots are open, that's what he said to me. The oil spigots are opening. I'm telling you, they're opening. They're going to open all across this land. They're opening. But what if, what if you're wrong? What if I'm right? But you, along with me, you prophesy that tonight. You spoke prophetically, you believed, you prophesied, you commanded the oil to come, to open. The oil spigots are open and they're coming. Now that may be bigger than moving a mountain. So God bless all of you for prophesying. And when the oil spigots open, you can say, I prophesied by the Holy Ghost that the oil was coming. Amen. And you'll be telling the truth. Amen. 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 God is good. Amen. Yes, is. After that, I just want to let you go. So for all of those that are watching, um, we love you. We bless you. And uh, just stretch your hands out toward the camera back there and say, grace, grace, grace. Amen. So we release grace to you, blessing, mercy, and peace, and we release the kingdom, righteousness, peace. Say, I release the kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed.